morning, good morning. I want to welcome everybody to First Baptist Church, North Kansas City, on this beautiful day. Um, we're going we're gonna to get going with worship, but before we do that, I'm going to open us up with some prayer. And so if you can bow with me for just a moment. Father, I'm so grateful for this opportunity that we have to be gathered, Lord, to worship, to hear your word preached, Lord, to be in the presence of your spirit. Father, I ask that you would be here today. Lord, would you bring strength and encouragement? We would be blessed by this opportunity for fellowship. Lord, uh, this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings shakes the whole earth who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross oh, oh you laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory? The King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of his brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. Yes, it is. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place That you would bear my cross Whoa, you lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you do Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. You're worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. So worthy. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave, and worthy is the Lamb who was slain. You're worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. Yes, it is. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. Oh, that you would bear.
You may be seated and welcome to First Baptist Church of North Kansas City. There is power in the precious blood of the Lamb, and we celebrate that here. And we give thanks as we just gather together and continue to praise our Lord this morning. I want to make sure that you all know that you are welcome here. And we have a welcome center in the foyer behind the sanctuary. And in that space, we have greeters that would just love to connect with you and give you a worship order. And give you more information about the church and give you the opportunity to leave information with us if you'd like for us to follow up with you. I want to thank you also for caring to wear your masks and social distance and that sort of thing because we seek to follow the CDC guidelines and the local mandates and the county mandates and so we really appreciate when everyone comes together and self-governs, self-regulates, is self-responsible to take care of protecting one another. And so we also have the school district that we've, you know, we take cues from them and follow guidelines from them. So there are some instances where we're more engaged with making sure we're in compliance and in our children and students area, we're gonna be more engaged and we're gonna follow guidelines. And of course, that naturally we're going to be more engaged with employees and staff for following guidelines. But we thank you for caring by wearing your mask, social distancing, and following guidelines on your own. So thank you very much. By the way, we had a back to school bash on Tuesday. And it was a lot of fun. Thank you. So many of you were there, and so many of you gave and donated and served. And you know what? 
it was fun to be with the community and we had lots of new families connect and come here and leave us information saying, yeah, follow up with me. Let me know what's going on in, in this space, this place, our church. And so that was a blessing. And we had kids walking out with new backpacks, strutting their stuff as they were going. And we were doing something to help them have a good start to the school year. So thank you for the back to school bash. Then I also want to make sure that everyone is aware that we have a personnel committee update on hiring today at noon following this worship service. If you happen to have a child in the nursery and you don't get them picked up by noon, they're going to bring them in here at noon to you. So we look forward to spending the morning with you and getting to know you better and worshiping more with you as we grow closer to one another and closer to Christ. Let's pray this morning. Father, we greet one another with the love of the Spirit that um, says peace and welcome and that says we want to know you better and connect with you well and love you well. So, Father, we know the precious blood of the Lamb is an expression of love, and we are so thankful for that love that comes from you through the Son and in the power of the Spirit. We're so thankful to be gathered today in this space to worship you. And so we continue this morning in a spirit of praise and of worship. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
want to come to a time of prayer. And uh, first of all, I just want to say, yes, I did break my arm. And I wish I could tell you that I did it doing something exciting like skydiving or something like that. But um, I can't tell you that. I, uh, I actually did it in my own house, uh, um, swinging my arms, not realizing I was right next to a door facing. And... Um, I whacked it on there. Um, so what I learned was that, um, you know, swing your arms in your own house is all fun and games until somebody breaks their arm. <laughs> and um, so, um, uh, but we want to come to prayer and, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of things on my heart and I'm sure on your heart too. And um, we want to uh, be lifting those up together corporately in our prayer time. But I know two things that have really been on my heart. Um, one is uh, the people of Haiti uh, with all that they're going through with the recent earthquake there. And then uh, the people of Af Afghanistan with everything that's going on there. And so as we pray, let's not only be praying for our own lives, but let's be praying for our world and even those who we don't know, but the Lord knows uh, who each one is. Will you, will you join me in prayer, please? Our Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And, and God, first of all, we just want to thank you for your love and for your faithfulness, that you would call us to pray, that, Lord, you would be our Savior who says, come to me, you who are weary and are burdened. Uh, and God, we come to you in prayer today. Lord, we come to, to pray today and say that we love you and that we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We want to, to pray today, God, realizing that there's, there's those in our own families, those in our own households that have special needs. And we wanna take each of those needs and place them before you. We trust in your word that says, cast your burden on the Lord for he cares for you. Lord, help us just to trust in your care and these needs that we put before you today. God, we, we want to pray for families that are hurting today. God, uh, some are hurting uh, just in relational ways, others in physical ways. Um, I'm, I'm reminded, God, of Fred Curtis Sr., long-term member of our church in the hospital, going through difficulties right now. Father, I wanna pray for our world today. We know that there's many needs throughout our world. We wanna pray for Haiti today. God, the people who are grieving the loss of loved ones, others, Lord, uh, been displaced, living as refugees. Father, uh, we, we pray for the government uh, of, of the country as they try to disperse the resources to get to the people who are truly in need. We pray, God, today for Afghanistan and, Lord, all that's going on there. I know, God, in our, our first service, we, we heard from our own uh, Jeanette Jones about a son-in-law, Gary, who's just been deployed as a military doctor to, to go there. We pray for the, the governments of our world, God, that we could reach peaceful solutions to these complicated issues that are before us. We pray, God, for our own leaders in this nation, Lord, that you'd give them wisdom and direction. Father, um, we come to say we thank you that you've, uh, you are a God who, who gives perfect peace because you were the Prince of Peace. We thank you, God, that you have given us promises like the one who comes to me, I'll in no way cast out. And so, Father, I pray that you would strengthen our faith to continue to bring whatever needs we have before you, realizing, God, that you're always there for us. I thank you, God, for the promise that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I thank you for the promise that you never leave us and you never forsake us. I thank you for the promise that you've given us that there's no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for the promise that uh, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
I thank you, God, for the promise that when temptation comes our way, you make a way of escape as we turn to you. I thank you, Lord, for the promise that you really are a God who instills within us peace and love and joy and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So may it be less of us and more of you as we give ourselves to you. And because you're so great and because you are worthy of all the praise and all the glory, may we, God, open up our hearts to trust you more and to worship you with all of our heart. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Sing to so sweet. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him for and all. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, my precious Jesus, and all.
Well, if you have your Bibles, if you would please uh, turn them uh, to Galatians chapter 3. We've been uh, walking through the book of Galatians. And, uh, and as you're turning there, I, I do want to uh, start out by reminding you of one of the more familiar scriptures, uh, probably one of the most familiar scriptures in the Old Testament, and that comes from the book of uh, Exodus, and it's when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses to give to the people of Israel when they had been rescued from Egyptian slavery. And uh, they were in a wilderness area around Mount Sinai, and we're going to put a, a couple pictures up and um, kind of uh, just remind you of that wilderness area. It had been three days to the month, or, or, or three, <laughs> three days to the month, three months to the day uh, since they had uh, gone through the Red Sea uh, and been rescued by God. And um, God called Moses to go up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. And so it, it says, first of all, in Exodus 19 that um, God had, had uh, called the people to be his people. And in, in Exodus 19, 8, it says the people answered God and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We want to be your people, God. And then in verse 10, it says that the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready on the third, for the third day, for on the third day, the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And then on that third day, Exodus 19, verse 18 says, now, and, and just imagine this scene, okay? It's been three days. They've consecrated themselves. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire, the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. <clears throat> and as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder, and the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up, and that's when Moses went up the mountain, and, and, and he received uh, the Ten Commandments there. And he received many, many other laws. And, and, and you know, that's where he got the law of like, uh, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an idol. And all these other laws. Then in Exodus 32, so that was in 19, and it goes through all these laws. And in Exodus 32, it says that after 40 days, Moses came down from the mountain and they had already broke the law about having no other gods and about not making idols because they had this golden calf idol and Moses got distressed and uh, he, he threw down the tablets and they shattered and Moses prayed for the people and then God called Moses back up the mountain to get the commandments again. And, and the second time when Moses came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, he was glowing with the very presence of God that he had been in. Now with all of that, Galatians chapter 3 Verse 10, all right, you ready? For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. The righteous, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And one of the questions here is, man, the Old Testament, the giving of the law was such an amazing and miraculous thing. And why is it that Paul is almost, it almost sounds like he's anti-law. I mean, in verse 10, he says, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. And in verse 11, it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law. And then in verse 13, Christ redeemed us. He set us free from the curse of the law. And I wouldn't call Paul anti-law. He, he understood the importance of the law. It shows us the holiness of God. But Paul is pro 
faith in Jesus Christ. And, and Paul's message is not the law is unimportant. It's important. It shows us God's holiness, shows us our sinfulness, but God's salvation does not come through law keeping. It comes through believing in what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the word gospel means good news. And the good news of Jesus Christ is that God, the holy God who created us, became flesh, became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. And he lived among us a sinless life, always keeping the law, not just the letter of the law, but the very intent and the very spirit of the law. He lived a perfect, righteous life. He knew no sin. And then when he died, which is the payment of the law, because the, the payment of sin is death, even though Jesus never sinned, he died. And when he died, he died as a substitute or a sacrifice for people who were sinners. And that's why when Jesus rose again from the dead, showing that there's victory over sin and victory over the death and the curse of the law, victory over hell, and, 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 and those who trust in him then share in that resurrected life with him uh, that is a, a, a life that's victorious over the curse of the law. Now, that, that, that's what we call the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, that by grace, God saves us from the condemnation of the law. Um, when I was in St. Louis, I had this guy come by my house one time and he was selling some stuff and I bought a little of the stuff that he was selling. And then I said, hey, can I, can I just ask you a question? I mean, where are you at like in matters of faith and, and matters of following Jesus Christ or do you even have faith in him at all? And he said, well, I read my Bible and I pray and I try to go to church sometimes. I said, can I read just a scripture with you? And he said, sure. And, and I said, just one scripture. And, and I turned to Romans 10, 9. If you will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And I said, what's that mean to you? And this guy says, well, you know, uh, you know it, it started talking to me all about believing in Jesus Christ and everything. I says, isn't it interesting? It doesn't say anything about praying and about going to church or about reading your Bible. And, and so we talked then about what it means to confess Jesus as Lord and to agree with God about who Jesus really is and how that's the foundation of a life of true salvation. And and, and that whole idea is basically the heart of the book of Galatians. Uh, because uh, in, in the book of Galatians, salvation is about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, not what we do for God in trying to keep certain laws. And so that's why the reformers, when they came along, they, they would come up with statements and slogans like, uh, uh, um, uh, like grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. And, and so the Galatian people understood that about salvation, that, that it's only through faith in Jesus Christ. But then there were some from the Jerusalem area, uh, some Jewish Christians that came to these Gentile Christians and started telling them all about the Old Testament law and all of the ceremonies of the Old Testament and how important they were. And, and so now you got these Galatian people who start out in faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And, and now all of a sudden they're thinking, the, well, the way we make progress now in the Christian life is by our ability to keep all these laws the way we think they ought to be kept and all of the laws that help us keep the laws that God gave us and all of the ceremonies. And Paul called them out on that back in chapter 2. And we looked at this when we were there. Galatians 2.18, Paul said, For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I've died to the law that I might live to God. Paul said when, he, when Paul said he died to the law, he wasn't saying the law is unimportant because it is important. What he was saying is that even though the law reflects reflects God's ways and it reflects God's goodness, it can't impart power to live the law and it can't bring us salvation from the curse of the law. Only Jesus can. <laughs> There's a Chicago pastor, his name is Colin Smith, and uh, he gives a good illustration. I, I think it's a good illustration on this. He says, imagine that your life is like two houses. <laughs> or, 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 or your <laughs> That, that's wrong already. Imagine that your life is a house and, and it could be built on two foundations. And so one foundation you can build on is yourself and your own righteousness, your own ability to keep the law, but the payment of, of your lack of righteousness is gonna be what? It's gonna be death, okay? And then he says, or you can build your life on Christ and Christ's perfect righteousness 
And, and, and now, uh, you know, the payment is paid by Christ, not by you, when it comes to the sins that he died for. So on the last day, those who build their lives on their own righteousness discover, man, the only way to make payment to God is through my death and eternal separation from him. So what can we do? Well, we tear down that house of our own righteousness and, and, and we move in to the house that Jesus has prepared for us based on his righteousness. And really, there's only two places we can live. Either our old address, it would be like, I can live in my old address, Jim Walker, under the law, built on my own righteousness, but man, the only way to make payment at the end is, is through, through my own self and separation from God. Or I can have a new address, Jim Walker in Christ, built on Christ's righteousness. And when the payment for my sin comes due, it's already been paid for by Jesus Christ. Now, that, that's why Galatians 2.20, which is a key verse in the, in, in, the, in the book of Galatians, we spent a whole week on just that one verse. Uh, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. I've died. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And, and then it goes on to say, and the life I now live in the flesh, I li I, I'm still living in this world. I live, however, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live not by my performance, to keep laws, I live by faith in Jesus who died for me and rose again and imparts God's spirit in me that it might empower me to live for him. So basically there's two dimensions to this. One is the death of Christ for me. That's what Jesus did when he died on the cross and rose again. And then there's the life of Christ in me and that's his spirit in me empowering me to live the life that Jesus would live if he was in my skin, okay? Now, last week, Pastor Mike helped us understand Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so foolish? God, or Paul was saying to the Galatian people, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, the Spirit of God has regenerated you, as you uh, to spiritual life as you've trusted in Jesus. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by your flesh? Are you now trying to uh, make progress in your Christian life by what you do for God when you started out just trusting in what God's done for you? <laughs> And, and, and so the idea here is that religious activity and our thing and religious activity, it's not how we move forward in the Christian life. We move forward not by our activity, but by Christ connectivity, by being connected to Jesus who saved us in the first place. Because as we connect to him, his spirit is unleashed in our life that we would live according to his spirit, which I might add is always consistent with the true, genuine meaning of God's laws. So well, one, one of the questions here is that if at the heart of the Christian life it is, is, is about surrendering to Jesus and trusting in him and his spirit living in and through me, then, then why the law? Why in the world would the Old Testament mention it 206 times the law of God? And it's mentioned many times in the New Testament too. And so what is the purpose of the law of God? And, and so I want to start to answer that by saying what the purpose of the law is not, and then we're going to end up just kind of going over what the purpose of the law is. So first of all, uh, what the purpose of God's law is not. <laughs> the purpose of God's law is not to bless us with the right standing before God. It says in verse 10, uh, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. If you, build, if you or I build our lives uh, on our ability to keep the laws of God, that's what's gonna determine our relationship with God, our ability to keep God's laws, we're gonna end up with a curse on our lives. And then he says, uh, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by the things written in the book of the law and do them. He's saying, if we don't do all the law, it doesn't matter if we're doing better than somebody else, we're still gonna be cursed before God. And then he ends up that verse by saying, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for the righteous 
shall live by faith. If we're really gonna live with the right standing with God, it's gonna come because of our faith in God, not because of our performance and being able to keep the laws of God because we can't keep all the laws. And he's talking about righteousness and he's talking about justice. And we've looked at those two words a lot as we've gone through the book of Galatians, but they go together because righteousness, or be, excuse me, because, because uh, justification is basically us having a right relationship with a God who is holy and perfect. How in the world can you have that kind of right relationship with God who is holy and perfect if you're not holy and perfect? It's only through being justified. Um, I, when, when I was a youth minister, I, I started out doing youth ministry uh, while I was at school at uh, Southeast Missouri State in Cape Girardeau. And so I lived in this little town called Sykeston, Missouri, which was a farming community. Some of y'all know it. Um, and uh, while I was there, uh, there was this one youth who wanted to take me hunting, but they don't call it hunting in Southeast Missouri. You don't go hunting, you go hunting, okay? And so I went hunting with this youth. I thought it'd be a good opportunity to hang out with them, even though I wouldn't, I, I'm not a hunter. Um, so... Um, we, we, we kind of went on these gravel roads and kind of back in this place. And he said, here's a good spot for us. And I'm like, are you sure? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we've hunted here before. We got permission here. And I'm like, okay. So we went hunting. And then when we came back to my car, there's this little note on my car. And this note on my car says, I hope you had a good hunt today. And then basically it said something like, if I ever find you on my property again, I'm going to prosecute your sorry hide, okay? So that's kind of the gist of what that note said. Well, I found out that who owned that property was one of the bank executives in Sykeston, Missouri. And so I made an appointment with them and I went in to see this bank executive and I brought this little note that was on my car and, and, and I showed it to him. I just said, man, I am so sorry. I did not realize uh, where I was at. I, and I explained I was with a youth and he thought that he had permission and he must have got mixed up and I'm so sorry. And, I, you know, I, I just apologize for being on your property. And this, this bank executive says, Man, that note, that was from my son. And, and, and you know what? You're always welcome on my property. You can come anytime you want. And I just wish that my son had stopped doing these silly things like this. And so he's mad at his son while I'm in his office. And, and here's the deal. My right relationship with the Father justified me before the Son. Now, when it comes to our relationship with God, it's kind of like exactly the same thing, but different, okay? <laughs> our, our right relationship with the Son justifies us before the Father. When I come to faith in Jesus Christ and I'm right there, now I'm right justified with the Father. And so it says in verse 12, but the law is not by faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. When we start relying on our ability to keep the law of God, to make us right with God, we're gonna, uh, you know, we're, we're putting ourselves under the law. And, and once we're under the law, there's this curse that is gonna come because we can never be right with God by our ability to keep the law. But Christ redeems us from that. And to redeem means to set free. It's, it's, the, it's the idea of, of, of buying a slave with the intent not of having that slave serve you, but the intent of having that slave set free to be who that slave is to be, okay? And that's what Jesus does. He sets us free from the curse of the law. So no matter how well we keep the law, it cannot bless us with a right standing before God. Uh, verse 14 says, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And, and so what is the, the blessing of Abraham? And the blessing of Abraham is that his descendants would be the chosen people of God. So by faith, on the one hand, on, on, on the one hand, the law was never purposed to bring us into a right 
standing before God. And then secondly, the law was never purposed to make us, it by, that by keeping the law, you would become the people of God. You don't become the people of God by keeping the laws of God. We become the people of God by trusting in Jesus. And as Jesus' spirit works in us, then we do keep the laws, okay? We, we can't say since, I've, since I've, I've, I've kept some of the laws of God and I redo, do some religious things, I must be the people of God. It says in verse 15, to, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. So God gave Abraham a promise. You're going to have descendants who are going to be the people of God. Nobody can undo that promise that God gave them is what it's saying here. All right. It's kind of like a couple, 21 years old. They elope. They get married. They come back. They have, they, they have this, this relationship now that is, is a legal marriage. An old boyfriend can't come along and annul it. Even a parent can't come along and annul it. It's already been made. God made a promise to Abraham. And, 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 and even a law that comes along later can't come along and undo the promise that was made. It's Abraham and his descendants who are the people of God. Verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. So, so the offspring of Abraham that the promise was made to, God makes a promise to Abraham and to an offspring, but the offspring was not Isaac, his, his son. The offspring was Jesus, uh, who, who his, his lineage uh, finally led to. And so God promised to Abraham through his offspring, Jesus, that there would be people of God. I, 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 one of my favorite verses is 2 Corinthians 1.20. It says, for all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. I love that verse. It's like, you know, how do you trust the promises of God in the Bible? It's through Jesus because they're all yes, you know. Uh, the, the promises about salvation, the promises about God's, salva uh, about, uh, God's presence with us, they're all yes in Jesus. And if the promise, that is all the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus, you know, and that, that, that those promises come because God made a promise with Abraham and God made a promise with Jesus and nothing can underdo, undo those promises. So what, is, what does this mean? Look at verse 17. Paul says, this is what I mean. <laughs> The law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul the covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. God promised Abraham his descendants through the offspring singular, which is Jesus, that they would be the people of God. And a law that comes along later doesn't annul that promise. That promise stands. Three things God never purposed the law to do. God never purposed the law to bless us with the right relationship with God. That comes through Jesus. God never uh, purposed the law to make, to, to, to make following some of the laws as that makes you the people of God. No, that comes through trusting in Jesus. And, and here's the third one. Uh, God never purposed the law to empower us to live with righteousness. Um, it says in verse 21, it is, is the law contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be the law. It, it, if having the law could empower you to keep the law, then, then you wouldn't need anything else. But having the law doesn't empower you to keep the law. <laughs> There's an old story uh, about Will Rogers. And Will Rogers, for those of you that don't know, he was a, an American celebrity back in the 1920s and the 1930s. Well, when World War II came along in the 1940s, Will Rogers met, he was asked to give a, a speech one day uh, to the, 
some of the military top leaders of the United States as World War II was beginning. So he's got all these colonels and generals and stuff like that. And he's given this speech and he says to them, uh, gentlemen, I have a plan to rid the waters of the Atlantic of the German U-boats, okay, and the submarines. And that was the big deal back then. And, and so they're all listening. And he says, uh, uh, if you would just bring the ocean water temperature to boiling, all of the U-boats, all of the submarines would have to surface and you could gather them all up and you could get rid of them. So somebody said, well, how in the world are we supposed to do that? And, and he says, I'm just telling you what you need to do. You guys got to figure out a way to do it, okay? I, man, I look at the Old Testament law and it's kind of like that. God gives us the law, you know, but just having the law doesn't empower us to be able to do it. You know, I mean, I mean, think about it for a minute. You shall not covet, the law says. You shall never want something that you don't need. You, you, you should never see an advertisement and think, oh man, that's what I need to make my life full. You, you know, I, you, you should never look at what another person has and has concern about what they have and about what you don't have. And it's like, man, I might as well boil the ocean as to never have a thought like that. You know, you shall never lie, steal, cheat, or break the law, never speed, never twist the truth a little bit, never misrepresent something, never take a piece of paper or a pen from the office, never take a piece of paper, a pen, or the stapler from the church office. And, you know, I, you know, I mean, never, never sin. I mean, I, you might as well boil the ocean. The law cannot give us a life of righteousness. It just shows us, you know. And so the law cannot bless us with the right standing with God. It cannot connect us to the promise of being God's people. And it cannot empower us to live a righteous life. So what is the purpose of the law? And that's how I want to end. The purpose of the law is to do three things. One, to show us our sin. It says in chapter 3, verse 19... Why then the law? It was added to the promise that God gave Abraham. It was added because of transgressions, because people are sinning. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it, and, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now the intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. So the promise you know, came from God to Abraham and Jesus. And, and here's my best understanding of this. The law came through angels to Moses. Okay, that's my best understanding of it. But why the law? Well, it was added because people were transgressing and they were breaking the laws. They didn't understand where God wanted them to go and what God wanted them to do. So God gave them the law in order to uh, help them to not consume themselves by living in ways where they don't even understand what the ways of God's word was. And so it was given so they could see it. You see, the law has value in the sense it shows us the right way. I mean, can you imagine a, a world where there's no laws? <laughs> I mean, it would be crazy just walking down the street, just going to the grocery store. You know, everyone's stealing, cheating, cursing, assaulting. There's no laws. There's no guidelines. Um, it would be chaos and confusion and violence. I mean, we all know that just the presence of a law makes us think differently. <laughs> Um, you know, a, a caution sign makes us think differently. You're, you're driving down the highway and you see a police car in the median. It just makes you think differently. You know, uh, the, the, the presence of laws, they, they curb us, uh, but, um, and, and, and they show us, uh, they show us right and wrong. They show us our sin. Here's the second purpose of the law, to show us our prison, uh, to, to show us the consequences of our sin. And in verse 22, it says, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, they were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith 
would be revealed. The, the law acts like a jailer. And a, jail stand, a jailer stands outside the, the, the jail cell, but it reminds the person in jail why they're there. <laughs> you, you know, and, and, and I think about the brokenness of the world, and you have all this brokenness in the world, and, and, and the law stands there and says, look, if we would just follow the ways of God, there wouldn't be all the brokenness in the world, you see. And so the law does that. It shows us, on the one hand, our sinfulness, how we, how we fall short of God's ways, but it also shows us the consequences of that sinfulness and the brokenness that it brings. And, and, and so uh, that brings me to the other thing, you know. I mean, when the law calls out our sins and defines it, <laughs> it, 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 the law can't give you forgiveness for when you fail the law, but Jesus can. And that's, that's the third part of the law, the third purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to show us our sin, show us the prison of our sin, but to lead us to Jesus. That's the third one, to lead us to Jesus. And, and look at verse 24. It says, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. So here the law is not just our jailer, but the law is also our, uh, he calls it our guardian. It's like a tutor or a nanny. And so somebody might have uh, their children and they want to give their children their estate, but they hire a nanny to take care of their kids, to get them to school, to teach them the right things to do so that they can live consistent with the identity of being an heir of the, the, the estate. That's what the law is supposed to do. It's supposed to show us the way we're supposed to go so that we can live consistent with our identity as an heir to the estate of all the things of God because through Jesus Christ we are people of God. So, uh, you know, uh, the guardian makes sure that they live consistent with their identity as an heir. So the purpose of the law, it leads us to Jesus, shows us our sin, shows us our prison, but it, but it, but, but it also leads to Jesus. It, it, it's, not, it's not the end game. The law is to show us that we need a savior because we have a prison and we need to be redeemed from the curse of that law. Um, I, I, I like this statement, it says, the law nails us to our sins and our sins nail Jesus to the cross, which is the fulfillment of the promise that God gave in the very beginning, that we can become children of God <laughs> through trusting in God as Abraham did when God gave a promise that we can become the descendants of Abraham. How? By keeping the laws? No, no. By trusting in the God of Abraham and, and in the offspring who is Jesus Christ. Have, uh, have you ever had problems with your basement flooding? And I have, actually. Uh, Gene and I, we tried to rehab a house one time and we did the basement. And, and it is, isn't this the way it always happens? It was like a week after we got the basement finished. Uh, we had all this rain and stuff like that. And um, I, I learned, uh, well, we, I mean, you know, I guess I, I learned two words I wished I would have never learned. And it was called hydrostatic pressure. And, and that's when the water table comes up and the pressure of that water seeps in uh, between the, the, the floor and the wall of the basement and water floods in. And we had that and we had to pull back our carpet and we had to get out uh, towels and then we got out a sump pump, but we could, I mean, excuse me, then we got out a, a shop vac, but we couldn't keep up with it. And I already blew my thing here because then I learned two other words that really I, I, it saved us and that was sump pump, okay? And um, because when we called in the sump pump guy, man, he came in, he did some, whatever he does to your basement, and all of a sudden we had no water problem at all. But we couldn't take care of it ourselves. And I think about our world that we live in, and you all know this, man, we have so much tension in our world right now. So, so much brokenness in our world right now. And it's like, 
man, people are running out of towels and they can't keep up with their own shop vac. And what we need to do is we need to tell people about the Savior. You know, we need to tell people that, that there's someone from outside us who can come and can rescue us in the midst of that. And I'm telling you, if we get, if we become, and, and there's so much religion in the world today, and if we become like the people at Galatia, and we start out with faith in Jesus Christ, but then we start making our Christianity all about how well we can live rules of religion and we're doing better than this one and, and it's all about our effort on everything and our performance on everything, we will never have time to tell other people about the Savior who we started with. And so, I think the message here is this. Uh, you know, in the midst of a world of religion, don't forget, we started with faith in Jesus. And it's only as we continue to renew that faith in Jesus that his spirit, as we surrender to him, his spirit is activated in our life. And in the spirit of God, we are the children of God. And in, 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 in faith in Jesus Christ, not only do we have the spirit of God in us, we have the empowerment of the spirit to live not only the letter of the law, but the very intent of the law. And we will live the life of Christ in us. And I'm telling you, there are thousands of people around us here in the Northland area. And, and many people are drowning in the brokenness of everything that's going on around us. And somebody's got to tell them that, here, call, call on the Savior. Here's the Savior I met. And that's our job. And we just can't be so focused on our religion. And am I doing better than somebody else? to be able to just share the answer, and that's Jesus. Let's pray. Father, some of us need to uh, come to faith in Jesus Christ. We, we, we maybe have been dabbling with religion, but Lord, what we really need is a Savior, and we thank you that there's a promise that comes in Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, something that we could never know through our religious activity. And Father, some of us need to come back to Jesus today for the peace and the joy and, and the direction and the renewal that only you can give. Lord, we, we want to be empowered to tell our neighbors and our friends and the hurting who are around us of a Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, um, I pray that as we come to you for either salvation or to be part of a church that that focuses and lifts up Jesus or God, whether it's for a personal renewal in our life, I pray that today would be the day that, Lord, we would let you have your perfect way in us. May it truly be that we surrender all to you. God, that it would be less of us and more of you. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand at this time. And... Uh, uh, Mike and I, we're going to be uh, here in the front, and um, we're here to, to welcome you. And um, if there's something on your heart that you just want to pray about, if there is uh, like just commitments of your life to Jesus Christ that you want to just check in with us about so we can pray with you, if you want to come and just be part of this church family and let's lift up Jesus together, we want to invite you today. Whatever that need is on your heart, we're here. And, We'll, 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 uh, we'll pray with you. You come as we sing. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I Till I lay my head, I will see of the goodness of You have 
have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend i have lived the good As you leave today, I want you to think about the commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt honor your father. And okay, you got them? Yep. Okay, now, now. We can either live our lives enslaving ourselves to that and doing the best we can and not failing along the way, or we can surrender our lives to Jesus and focus on faith in him. And as we focus on him and our faith in him, here's the promise of God. You shall live your life and you shall not steal. You shall live your life and you shall not covet because with his power in you, you'll live the life of Christ in you. So let's go live for Jesus as we go. Blessings. Amen.